everybody. Um, for those of you who were uh, here earlier, uh, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who weren't, I'm Eric Bain Selbo. I'm um, Executive Director of the Society for Values in Higher Education. I'm also uh, here in Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, I am Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at IU Kokomo. And uh, we're running just a couple minutes late. We ran into a slight problem. Um, no, I'm not muted. Uh, Ryan, uh, others have said they can hear me. Um, so I'm tracking the chat. Um, and if uh, Tony, Jack, and, and Tressie would like to um, use their video and unmute themselves. Hi, Tony. Hi. Hi, Tressie. Hi there, Eric. Hey, Tony. Hey, good to see you. You too. Um, so you all can hear me fine. I can hear you. Um, and I'm getting uh, some positive messages from the uh, chat group. Um, and, uh, and so I think we're ready to go. Um, and so let me just uh, say a couple of things about the structure here. Um, we had, um, I had uh, planned to do this with a colleague of mine, uh, Fiona Tolhorst. Um, and, uh, but we're having some technical difficulties at her end. Uh, so you two are stuck with me, sorry. Um, <laughs> and uh, stuck with me and whatever questions come up from, the, from our audience. And so we are um, uh, scheduled for until, let's see, it's 2.30 uh, Eastern time and we'll just see how the, the conversation goes, but we'll definitely end by then. Um, so what I'm going to do is I, I've introduced myself. I, I thought that the um, uh, uh, Tony and, and Tressie could best introduce themselves. Um, I did want to say um, a quick something about their books, which I just highly recommend. And so um, this is Lower Ed. Um, I've got it up here on the screen. Um, and uh, that's Tressie's book. And then... Um, Here's uh, the privileged poor. And for those of you who are interested in these books, you should be, and you should go purchase them. Uh, and in the Whova app, you, uh, there are links to these books. And if you use the links in the Whova app, you'll also be supporting a local bookstore uh, here in Kokomo, Indiana. So um, I would en encourage people to um, do that. Um, so what we thought was we would uh, have uh, both of our guests uh, just take about five minutes or so uh, and introduce themselves. Um, and uh, then I'll get us started with uh, a couple of questions that, that uh, uh, Fiona and I were thinking about. Um, and then we really want to open it up to the others. So. Um, I'll get started and let Tony, oh, I thought he had a pet issue it looked like and I was going to get started, but whoever would like to go first is fine. Well, I actually was looking for something because oh, hi. I had to find it on my shelf. I was like, where is it? Um, for those who haven't had a chance yet to read Thick, especially in the time that we are, uh, the experiences that we are having right now in the world, um, I highly recommend uh, Investigation into race and inequality and gender that kind of opens up the conversation, not only within higher ed, um, but kind of society as a whole. So really thinking about how do we actually study inequality in all its forms, both interpersonal and structural. Uh, I was personally really excited to see Tracy's name on and know that I'd be in conversation with Eric and Tracy today. So I just wanted to put that out there because I think a lot of people are running to books that are a little bit too light and easily digestible for because they're not really saying much as compared to one that is really making us grapple with the long-standing legacy of racism and exclusion in the country. I highly recommend thinking 
the National Book Award Committee agree with me. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Tony. But, but now Tony's introduced Tressy. And I'm introduced <laughs> me. So I just moved. All of my books are stacked outside the door. I've lived in this house for about five days now, or if I run and go get Tony's, uh, it is a pri pri privilege to be here uh, with Tony. And in fact, when uh, they reached out to me about being here today, they said Tony's name. So I said yes, which I've done every time anyone has said Tony's name to me. Um, and I've said that for a couple of reasons. Um, Tony's create creativity and his approach to scholarship um, and research design are on display in the privileged poor, which is which does this thing that I think is very important in our contemporary understanding of inequality, which is to revisit our assumptions about what the categories that we use to talk about and measure inequality actually mean. What does poor mean? To actually think about the internal contradiction of being both privileged and poor is a consequence to me of the current political economy that shapes higher education, which is that both of those things can be true. It is the same inherent uh, contradiction to me that is evident when we talk about expanding access that also fundamentally continue, uh, adds additional layers of stratifying good access to higher education. There are these internal contradictions right now, I think in the very idea of public good, access, affordability, that are embedded in the contradictions of something like being both privileged and poor. And it is an amazing book, I think, uh, for that reason and for many others, it happens to be well written um, and grounded in, I think, the sort of self-reflexivity that I'd like to see more scholars in higher education take up, particularly considering what our challenges in higher ed are right now. And so it's always a pleasure uh, to be with Tony. And so here's a cheat sheet for anyone who'd like me to attend an event. Ask Tony to be there and then tell well, him to come in. We will remember that. <laughs> That was fun. This is better than talking about myself. Yes. I love talking about yeah. my colleagues' work. That is a lot more enjoyable. Oh. Uh, so, Tracy, congratulations. So, you're starting at the University of North Carolina, I believe. That is correct. Yeah, I'm at the University of North Carolina, um, the School of Information, uh, as of right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, whatever the fall semester brings, I'm a professor here now. Very good. Uh, and Tony, could you tell us, uh, just to tell folks a little bit about where you are and what you're doing? Yes, I am a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows and an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, it's been kind of a treat um, to be at the School of Education because one of the pillars on which we are, we built, we built, uh, the school was built and also how we are evaluated is on usable knowledge. And one of the things that I hope we can talk about today is the way in which both of these works um, and the work that we do um, is not written for other sociologists only. It's not written for just people who study what we study. It's important for administrators, for politicians, for community leaders to have an understanding of how inequality manifests themselves in higher education, but also expanding our own, our own conception of what higher education is because we often forget about for-profit colleges. We often forget about um, lower income students at more set the colleges and everything in between. And so I really uh, appreciate the, the, the space to, to have these kind of conversations. Right. Well, and actually that, that uh, is a great segue into the, into the first question that Fiona and I were thinking about uh, with both of these books um, is the fact that, um, I, I mean, not only should a, a broad range of people read both of these, um, uh, who, who care about higher education or uh, in, in, in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, but they're also just like wonderful reads. Um, and one of the things that uh, makes them so interesting is the ample use of interviews uh, that both of you do uh, in your works. And I was wondering if you could start out by just uh, saying something about how critical those interviews were to the research um, and what kind of deeper or more no, nuanced information did you get from the, the interviews uh, that you just wouldn't have been able to get from, you know, research in a library or online or something like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I am a, a huge proponent of mixed methods where the question justifies it. 
um, uh, you know, always the guiding principle, which is let, you, let your research question determine your methods. Having said that, we've got a lot of incentives that move us away from in-depth qualitative work in the field of higher education, the sociology of higher education, and I would say the sociology of education just sort of writ large. Some of that is just driven by our professional dictates that it is perhaps faster, more efficient to get your publications done so that you can meet your professional marks for publication if you use quantitative data. Uh, there are a lot of financial incentives out there for us to adopt quantitative methods, all wonderful approaches, but we have probably shifted too much towards a quantitative form of inquiry when there's so much structural change happening. So one of the things that I started with in this book is that when structure, social institutions are undergoing sort of dramatic change, you really do have to go back and revisit your theory of why you would ask this thing. Does it still operate the way that we think that it does? So for the question of race, class, gender, and higher education access, those terms have all of the publication records and you could use them uncritically, but when you're undergoing rapid transformation, which I would argue we are undergoing right now, it really does behoove us to start from the beginning. Do these terms mean what we think they mean? And the best way to figure that out is on the ground engagement through participant observation and interviewing people's experience of that social transformation. Um, so I really, it was, there was actually no way that the project or the book could have been done without speaking to students. But even if it had been able to be done without speaking to students, I really privileged the student um, and more broadly the, the, the administrative point of view. It was very important to me that I deal fairly with the perspective of um, administrators and executives in the for-profit college sector, um, because you don't want to beg the question, right? Maybe something really is happening here uh, that is that we are missing um, in, uh, especially in quantitative data, but especially in po uh, polemics, we can really miss uh, people's perspective of their social realities. So it was hugely important. And this is one of the things that I think uh, that kind of inquiry does. Something, by the way, that Tony does really well also in The Privileged Poor. One of the reasons I think this, these books stick so well, particularly with political um, actors and um, administrators and the broader public is because they can hang their hat on the narrative structure yes. of the analysis. I am called to Congress far more for my narrative powers than I have ever been called to Congress for my empirical powers. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, it is true that in our work, empirics drives our professional status, but impact is still driven by narrative and by stories. Now, the stories can be empirically grounded and should be. The most powerful stories are the ones where you don't fudge the data, but you still find an interesting story. Right, that's the challenge for me um, of all of my work. Find the interesting story while being true to the data that constructs the story. But it is the stories that have moved the narrative around politics, student loan debt, access, inequality. It's been the stories more so than empirics. I'd actually be interested in Tony's experience and suspect that he has a similar one, but that's why it was important. If I wanted the work to matter, and I did, I was very baldly honest about that. Um, then it was important to me to center uh, students' understanding of their social experiences, because that is the way we sort of move the needle on the conversation. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, the question, you know, a lot of people, when they read our, you know, sometimes we have to go up against a, we fight a very interesting battle that accessibility or writing accessibly or writing well is seen as somehow not being as rigorous or not being as um, intellectually engaging when it's actually it's actually harder to write for a much wider group of people to understand a complex thing like how segregation mm -hmm. and poverty and um, joblessness travels with students all the way to college and then thereafter right and so it's very very important but Tracy is right you have to your question will determine your approach right are you asking a what question yes. or a how or why right are you talking about macro level trends then you need some quantitative data for that you need some census data you need some data from Kofi you need some data from um, college board or wherever but if you're asking like some of the hows and whys like how are students feeling why are they not going into different support services? Um, 
you know, how come this group is, is, is excelling um, better than this group and something more than just your R squared needs to be adjusted, right? Like there are mm -hmm. a lot of things that we go into, but you're absolutely right. It is the narratives that allow people to, that allow the argument to be transported from page, from, from the page to action, right? Mm -hmm. From page to policy. How do we get people to understand what students are going through or what administrators are going through on a daily basis if we can't, we can't detail that experiential nature of their jobs or their lives? Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important for me, you know, especially as a, as someone who was trained by cultural sociologists, I want to understand the meaning making, right? I want to understand how people attribute meaning to things in their lives because then we are better able to understand their actions, right? Because if we keep doing things in a void, using only statistics, we're going to start enacting policy and saying, well, look, the numbers are changing, but then some of the other things on the backside are completely stagnant. Like, yeah, you're, you're admitting more students, but they are being disproportionately hurt in different ways once they get on your campus, right? What are the ways in which we need to understand the experience as well as the major shifts? And qualitative research, whether it's ethnography, whether it's interviews, participant observation, we, um, gives us that gives us a texture of reality, right? It is that thick description, right? It's thick description with an analytical edge. It's the way in which you can actually paint a picture of life that comes alive on the page but but then it also gives you a very specific way of thinking about how policy levers can be pulled to alleviate different kind of inequalities. Yeah, and and it seemed to me that I mean in both cases you all had ex exam like powerful stories that for for people uh, connected with those institutions or uh, uh, you know working within higher education uh, the kind of stories that that you look at and somebody, you know, even if it's their own campus might say, oh, I did not know that students felt that way. Like I didn't, you, you know, because the, um, in, in many ways is I think uh, researchers, you, both of you seem to be able to have people just be brutally honest. Um, and, and I think that that was, um, you know, sometimes uh, you know, in those casual conversations, you know, as a, uh, a faculty member, or as an administrator, um, when you uh, talk to students, you, you you may not get that same response, right? And so it, it, it was really interesting how you uh, were able to sort of dig deeper. Um, I'm, I have another question and, and uh, uh, for the both, uh, both of you, and, uh, and then I just want to remind people to also use the Q&A function. Um, yeah, I can see that. Can see okay. Or, or I, can't, I can't see Q&A, I can only see chat. So if you want me to help me do it. Please. Okay, actually I've gotten directions from off stage here. Um, so use the chat for any questions um, and, uh, and we'll gather the, the questions uh, there. Uh, but the uh, one for both of you, in both of these books, you highlight forms of inequality in, post -secondary, uh, ed, in the post-secondary education world. What are the most appalling inequalities that are present today? Um, that, might be, that might be a long list. Uh, what are the most appalling um, inequalities? Uh, and what should uh, people in post-secondary education, I mean, how should we be responding to these? What should we be doing? How can we combat these? Mm. Um, some of the most profound inequalities about which I am personally and professionally obsessed are the ones that shape the point of access and the point of exit from higher education, um, which, you know, perversely enough means that those of us in secondary, post-secondary higher education don't have that much control of them, but we are the ones who have to deal with them. Uh, so some of the statistics that just really, um, you know, that I will never forget sort of engaging with both in this work and that I continue to just go, I don't understand why this doesn't keep everyone else up either, is that in state after state, you can compare the college readiness of uh, students who have done everything right, right? This is one of my things. The people who have followed the social prescription for social mobility. Right? And we all know what that is. You work hard, you enroll in the hard classes, you do your extracurriculars, you know, 
uh, if you are a, a woman, you don't have children, right? You don't start your family early. You do all of these things, right? And then still end up with these neutral to negative post-secondary uh, uh, points of access or outcomes and returns. Um, and the statistic that really bothers me, even my home state here of North Carolina um, is an example. And this is work by Sandy Darity and those at the um, Equity Lab um, the Samuel Cook Equity Lab at Duke University that shows that an African-American student in the state, by virtue of where they live and the school, public school to which they are assigned, could never have been prepared for admission to the state flagship university, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Not because of any individual failings, but because their school doesn't offer advanced placement courses, doesn't offer the right math courses, right, doesn't have the right extracurriculars, et cetera, the student who has done everything right would still not be quote unquote prepared for competitive higher education access in this public university of their home state, the one that subsidizes their post-secondary option. That is a point of inequality to me when we think about um, the stratification and prestige economy of higher education that keeps me up at night. That is a student in a family and community that never stood a chance um, of competitive admission. Now, you pair that with Tony's point, by the way, that even if you are exceptional, and by exceptional, I don't mean skilled, exceptionally lucky and fortunate to have lucked into a program, to have met the right gatekeepers along the way, you get access to a highly selective institution. We know that your experience of the benefits of that institution do not accrue to you the same, right? It doesn't transform your life the way it does your other peers. If the transformation potential of higher education is not equally born by all students or equally available for all students, we're gonna have a tough time defending the public good mission of higher education, right? And then that becomes a self-defeating loop. How do we justify funding, state funding and investment? How do we justify the political shielding and capital that institutions uh, enjoy? Well, one of the things that I think we're dealing with now um, as a sector is that it's difficult for us to defend ourselves as a public good. Uh, when we have participated in and benefited from these trend lines for as long as we have. Um, that jeopardizes the overall idea of higher education about which I'm personally very passionate. Um, so those inequalities keep me up at night. What do we do about that? I, there are two things I wanna put forward. One is I am looking out over the landscape right now, of the, you know, COVID campus and COVID higher education in this particular moment. And I've been struck by something that I was struck by when I was doing lower ed. And that is that there is not a singular voice in public discourse defending the idea of higher education. Not an institution. Universities have their presidents, <laughs> right? <laughs> Universities have their sinecures who go out and defend the inst their institution. That's what they're paid to do. But there is not a single voice out there saying, listen, just as an entity, as a sector, right? We matter and this is why. And I think that's why we see the disconnect between public support um, for higher education and their belief that you need it to go to college. There's this sort of growing disconnect between people's um, investment in higher education as an idea. And that's why I think people are a little resentful about higher education because it doesn't feel like a per something that they personally benefit from. And I think that's because we have a vacuum there of sector leadership. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that I think we just have to take uh, quite seriously the diversity of our faculty and administrators and those who represent the institutions in various capacities and communities. Because to your earlier point, Eric, we hear different stories based on our social location. There are different truths. Only Tony could have done Tony's work. And frankly, I like to think only I could have done my work because it is our connections to these communities and to a narrative and a type of respect that I think we bring for those communities to our research apparatus that makes them feel seen and that shifts the conversation so that people are more invested in higher education. And so those are things that uh, keep me up at night. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we started with the you know, what, what goes back to the philosophy of equality of life chances, right? The fact that mm -hmm. we can go to any hospital in America and, and predict with statistical accuracy, um, if we go to the nursery uh, at a hospital with, with statistical accuracy, what baby won't make it 
past mm-hmm. 18, which one will go to jail, who will be married, who won't, who, who will have children out of wedlock, because these are the, these are the metrics that we care about, statistically speaking, right? And so when I think, when I think about that, I also think about just how we have this belief that somehow the, the day you graduate from high school is some kind of like um, panacea or something. Mm-hmm. That all now, all the social ills that you have been, um, that you have had to struggle through, all the kind of things you have to, to, to deal with um, are now somehow when you get to the college gates are completely gone. And we ignore the porousness of the boundaries of college, right? We want to talk about the town gown divide or, or whatever, but the porousness of those boundaries. I thought back to the Boston Valedictorian study that was released earlier um, earlier last year, when they found they they did a study. They were like um, Boston a couple of years ago took a took a photo of every single one of the Valedictorians and then decided to do a five to seven year follow up. And they were surprised that so many of their valedictorians were homeless, didn't finish high school, didn't finish college, and really struggled. And they asked me what I thought. And they were like, well, Tony, you know, like four of our valedictorians were hungry, you know, were homeless, um, you know, after college. And I said, that's not the right question to ask. How many were homeless before college? Mm-hmm. Because if we're actually going to have a marker of what kind of payoff or what kind of things, being valedictorian does not erase poverty. The way in which we think about higher education as a, sco- a sociologist and a sociologist of higher education, we really don't consider poverty and inequality enough in how it shapes how students move through higher ed, no matter what, no matter what type of school that we're going to. The fact that we are, in some respects, only really now having a national conversation about basic needs of our students, and we're talking about homelessness and food insecurity, um, um, uh, housing and security and other things, how, how much has the conversation about financial aid monopolized our conversation about money and social class in college that now we are only paying attention to things that are literally affecting students on an everyday basis? And then even then, going back to your previous question, the, all the conversation about homelessness, job and, uh, food insecurity has been so quantitatively inclined that we've only paid attention to the rates. And we haven't even talked about, they, they, they haven't even talked about the way it varies across institutions, because again, it's all about the rate. You know, the fact that I found, you know, the, you know food and housing and security at schools like, from, from schools like Michigan and Harvard and Princeton and Amherst, yes, in Wisconsin and yes, at Berkeley and other places, but the nature of it is different, right? If we don't get a handle on the, on the inequalities that literally handicap and undercut our students' academic experiences, all the initiatives that we have about like improving success, improving retention, improving all of those things will always miss, miss the mark and won't help students enough. You asked about the big issues. The more and more I stay in higher ed, the more I realize it's not the big issues that hurt students the most. It's that mountain of small um, slights, hurdles, stumbling blocks, um, Legos that you step on, like those kind of moments that really leave the pain of like, am I supposed to be here? Because there is so much that we take for granted that I hope anyone who engages my work leaves with them, leaves asking a question, what else have I taken for granted? When I mentioned office hours in the book, it was because I went around to 75 you know, stops along the book tour and still have not met 10 faculty members who define office hours on their syllabus. Do I think defining office hours is gonna revolutionize higher education? No, but the thought behind it, the thought that we assume that because a student is sitting in our classrooms, they have a, 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 certain, set of, a certain set of skills and knowledge that is highly classed and you only get access to those things if you either have family who have been through it or you've been part of certain institutions, right? How do we begin to make sure it's not the equivalent to um, microaggressions that are keeping students in secondary positions at first rate institutions that they've been ad- admitted to? Because oftentimes the students will tell me, Tony, I can tell you stories about the big things that tripped me up, but the things that kept me up the things that kept me from feeling like I belong were the small everyday reminders that I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah, I, I, for, for those who haven't gotten to uh, Tony's uh, book yet, 
like in the last 30 minutes. Um, the, uh, the, um, the thing about the office hours, and it made, when I read it, it made complete sense that a student w might imagine that office hours meant that was the time that faculty worked in their office and you needed to leave them alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and once I read it, it was like, oh, well, yeah, I could see where somebody would come away thinking that that's, that's what it means, right? And, uh, um, and so uh, I think I need to go back and change my syllabus still. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so um, the, uh, we, we have some questions popping up, and I wanted to, to get to one that was following up on something, uh, Tressy, that you mentioned, uh, but it's, it's really for both of you. Um, how can we... Um, how can we most effectively use these narratives? This is thinking, I think, in terms of both, um, you know, who's defending higher education, who's sharing our stories um, to the public. How can we use some of these narratives as a way of swaying the power brokers, the people who we really need to get on our side, right, uh, in terms of addressing, um, in this case, maybe not the, the small hurdles, right, the, the, the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it probably works for on both. Um, um, and I love that point, let me just say from Tony's book, and I have called it, you know, um, death by $20 cuts. Like everybody wants to talk about giving students $20,000 mm -hmm. and the students I talk to, it's the hurdles of $20. Mm -hmm. I will get them. It's the hurdle of like, yeah, not knowing office hours, right? Right. The, those are those micro um, narratives that Tony is talking about are just so powerful. And incidentally, then to answer the question, they become powerful narrative political tools. But first, you have to know what they are. You can't start, <laughs> you can't tell an effective story until you've got an effective story. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is to, I think, invest in, expand our disciplinary professional imagination about even the data we collect and the studies we undertake, um, that they have to listen as much as they do capture. Now, we do a lot of data capture in our line of work. Um, the entrance and the exit survey, uh, the focus group, um, uh, the student um, uh, satisfaction survey, campus climate survey. Um, mm -hmm. We do a lot of these, right, that are wonderful, but a, di a dimension of a multi-dimensional part of the story. And so I think one of the things that Tony said so eloquently that I would reiterate here um, is that these stories to be powerful first have to be true <laughs> and they have to be fleshed out and we're going to have to create professional space for people to do those stories and to do that kind of data collection and narrative storytelling um, and qualitative uh, and mixed methods research to do it. Once we have, I think, that story about how do you share it in a way to shape the public imagination, um, and you said, Eric, uh, with power brokers, and I'm going to tell you, I don't know that power brokers need to be our audience. And I'll tell you why. I think it is let power brokers do what power brokers have to do. And so if they don't have to listen to your compelling story, it really doesn't matter how compelling it is. One of the things I found, I spent way more time on Capitol Hill than I ever imagined over the last five years. I've never wanted to touch politics. It seems like a horrible job. I'm glad someone does it because it seems to be necessary, but it's not my job or my work. But I was close, right? I'm in Richmond, Virginia, and I was doing this work with policy implications. And so I end up there quite a bit. And one of the things that struck me is that people wanted the narrative to make the case that they were already willing to make. So that said to me that the most important thing we could do was share our narratives with people, the people that shift what powerful uh, people listen to. I think this is more about people power than it is about power brokers. Mm -hmm. Meaning I am intrigued with and have worked with, um, you know, out of the tradition of freedom schools that come out of the black educational um, uh, uh, social organizing space of these community-based um, schools, reading groups. We had a wonderful, um, at a conference I hosted last year, we had a wonderful training session about how you have a reading group in a community, not embedded in a school or an institution, but how we could plug into people reading together and talking about these ideas together. I think it's changing the public narrative about why higher education matters. 
that's the material condition that politicians care about, right? Because ultimately politicians care about being re reelected. So there are tons of politicians on Capitol Hill that know that our funding scheme, for example, for higher education is screwed. They know it, but their constituents don't. And because their constituents don't, they don't care. It is not on their list of political priorities. So I actually think it's moving the needle on the public discourse which feels risky for a lot of us. And I'm very empathetic to that, trust me. Uh, I've been public far longer than anybody should be. Um, so I'm, I'm empathetic to that, but I think the stakes are sufficiently high enough that we have to be out there speaking to community groups. We have to speak to unions. I think we should need to go out there and make our case to people power uh, once again, many of whom for the record do not feel welcome in our university spaces. There is a union, a wave of unionization happening in this country. And I think public education should be part of that conversation. I think that we are out there speaking at K through 12 schools in our religious and spiritual communities. I think that yes, we are writing the op-eds and we are appearing when it's appropriate on television, but that public life is broader than just the broadcast media. And we really uh, do well when we take our stories out into that domain. Mm -hmm. What I want to ask that is, and it's, it's, the, it's the next step to what Tracy's talking about, we also have to make sure that we know our audience and we link what kind of storytelling that we need mm -hmm. to do to that audience. If I'm trying to get a school to start a food pantry or to address food insecurity, and I'm teaching, I'm, I'm just speaking to the, um, the, um, the uh, what, what do you call it? the bursar's office or mm -hmm. the, um, um, the, the, the chief finance person, the CFO, I might not actually start with the narratives of the students first off. I may actually start with saying, here are the, imp here are the consequences of food insecure students. It actually costs us more money because of X, Y, and Z, and it has this added impact of students having negative experiences, which is going to affect alumni donations, right? So even knowing that they care about the purse strings, how much money is coming in versus coming out, I also want to make sure I know the audience, right? So you have to think about the storytelling as head, heart, and pocket, especially when you're talking about within universities, but also with politicians as well, because there are some people who want the narrative because they want to feel as if that student is their niece or nephew or their cousin who they, who they are the favorite cousin of. And then there are some people who need to have a conversation be with, you know, thinking it through and other people who want to understand what are the financial responsibilities of their institution or their community. So the thing about storytelling and the reason why it is powerful to not only have stories, but also not have stories that are so that are, that are just like one-off stories that are so outrageous that it wasn't representative in your data, right? Because I, I'm sure Tracy probably did this. I chose the most representative. Yes, yes. That is from so the sect critical. of yeah. groups. Right. Right, I didn't choose the, 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 the poverty, the poverty sob story. I didn't choose the most um, like, oh, I know this is gonna get on the front page of something. I chose the most representative experiences mm -hmm. of the students for each group or for each chapter that I was writing for, because that gave me the ammunition to talk to very different audiences. Mm -hmm. I never thought that my book would be on the front page of the, of the Senate library. Um, when, when we shared it, I know, you know, I, I, I thought, yes, yeah, some, you know, university folks would be interested in it, but then it had took on life of its own because not only this accessibility, but for its understanding of how forces outside of schools and colleges are shaping the lives of those who make it in. Mm -hmm. And the way in which you engage that is that you don't leave, you know, your you have to know your audience. And that starts with having the best data to be able to engage people's hearts their minds and and those who control the pocketbooks and the purses of a university or whatever system that you are are, are involved in. And I, that's the only thing I wanted to add to that because knowing your audience is key. And bingo, and can I say this is the difference yes. between sociology or social science writ large and journalism. Our mm -hmm. stories are representative, they are embedded in that macro, that macro meso level data we have tried to the best of our ability to account for points of differentiation and points of convergence. We have paid attention to theoretical mechanisms. After we do all of that, we find you a good story. Thank you for that, Tony. Yeah, and I just wanna uh, second uh, 
Tressie, the, the point about uh, institutions engaging with their communities, um, not as, you know, experts from on high, you know, who come with all the answers, but as, um, as individuals who really want to engage others in conversation and talking about ideas and talking about community issues, um, that, you know, when institutions can go from being that place where you send your 18 to 22 year old to that place that you engage with over the course of a lifetime, mm -hmm. it really does change. You know, I get back to this, the, the question you had about um, who's defending higher education yeah. and, you know, presidents do and chancellors do, um, and a lot of them are very effective. Um, but what we need is the public defending higher education. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Um, we have a, uh, a question here. Um, so we've got about uh, 70 people here on our webinar from a pretty wide array of, of different institutions. Um, and this question is, how do we get predominantly white institutions to work on dismantling white supremacy when they are invested in seeing themselves as progressive and as the antidote to that supremacy? Well, Tony, what do we think here? <laughs> uh, if we knew how, well, I'll only speak for myself so far, which is that if I knew how to divest white institutions from white supremacy, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Mm. <laughs> We'd be having a very different talk at a very different party. I mean, really. Um, I, I don't think anything changes an institution like changing the material conditions of an institution. So I suspect the levers are related somehow to financing. Mm -hmm. um, institutions do what they have to do to stay financially viable, point blank. So if the, if the structure of white supremacy and inclusion and exclusion, that sort of di diversity, equity, inclusion model of uh, you know, liberal white racism rules the institution, it is because there's capital attached to it. Um, so I suspect it doesn't happen within, within the institution. This has been my own professional um, position on this anyway, which is that it's neither my job nor within my professional capacity to divest pre uh, predominantly white institutions from white supremacy. What I can do is promote an idea of um, humanism that centers Black Lives Mattering in the fullest sense of the word uh, that I would hope would move eventually the political capital of predominantly white institutions. But I honestly just don't think uh, that's possible for me professionally. If you, however, are in a capacity in a PWI that has some authority over budgets and access, which I think are the important levers um, in uh, all institutions, but I think especially in PWIs, and even more so for selective and highly selective PWIs. I think that there uh, is always space. I, I do these talks sometimes for administrators. I did one uh, re uh, last year for the sociologists of women in society that wanted to talk about how they could be a radical feminist uh, administrator. Um, and there's a working group there that is working on what that would look like. Can you be um, a bureaucrat in a large complex organization and enact radical intersectional feminist policies. Um, and so I think part of it starts there and having a conversation about what that looks like when you are embedded in an organization. Uh, there are gonna be some strict limits on what you can do, but I think if Tony's work is especially shown as anything, um, uh, and I'm thinking about other work that has been done, especially at elite institutions, shows us that there are a lot of micro decisions that absolutely do matter um, to the application, at least, of white supremacy in our institutions. Again, they look like paying attention, I think, to the, uh, the, um, the micro spaces, uh, negative spaces. So um, again, what kind of small pots of money are available and for whom and under what conditions? I always think that one of the most powerful things we can do to be radical in an organization is to create space and to funnel organizational resources to under-resourced uh, uh, people and groups. I am all about shifting the resources of my institution um, to organizations that do a better job within those communities, however that looks. That looks like if I have an event, my food vendor is probably a woman of color. 
I am the queen of an empanada at an academic conference for this reason. I will go anywhere in this country and find the Hispanic woman who makes empanadas. And at my academic conference, you will eat empanadas. I am a huge fan of the fact that anything that I have control over, we will work with a black bookseller. I will work with the radical um, feminist booksellers. If I'm going to put together a reading list, my links are going to go to organizations that are embedded in those communities. If I've got a vendor relationship that I'm responsible for, I don't need to go through the equity and inclusion office to make sure that the people who are bidding on it aren't all white or aren't, aren't all male. Those are, the, I think, those micro decisions that we can make. Yeah. You know, and I like this question because I think we also have to realize it's not just PWI institutions that, that are invested in this kind of um, exclusionary practices writ large, right? I also want to focus on like when, when people say white supremacy, like to, you cannot disentangle that from the way in which social class works in this country. Right. When you think about redlining, blockbusting, GI Bill, like all of these policies that literally created the white middle class and gave them a floor to fall on rather, rather than, a, than a ceiling that Black and Latinx folks are trying to break through. But like you cannot disentangle that. And so the way in which like higher education as an enterprise has been such, you know, it is both race and class that I don't want us to fall. You know, yeah, we definitely need to push and um, push institutions and, and and do a lot. But I also want to make sure that we don't forget the way in which social class um, underscores a lot of the exclusionary practices that we see. I also I also say that because we sometimes I think sometimes now in the moment everybody wants to like okay let's blow things up now and let's start from scratch tomorrow. That's not how change happens. Happens. That's not how a substantial change happens, right? It's, it's not, I don't think it's going to be quick. I don't know what it's going to look like. I know that it will take, it will take time, but there are moments that you can actually see things changing, right? It's like those small deflections that are going to, um, you know, to, to, not to right the ship, but at least point it even more in the direction uh, um, that it should be going of, of this generation, so the next generation cannot have the same kind of problems, right? That's what motivated me. Like, I, when I began this research, one of the questions I asked myself is like, it's one that I'm sure many people in this call have, is like, how am I experiencing, how am I hearing about the same thing that I experienced, you know, in 2003 when I started this research? Why are we, you know, why are students having to re-experience, not reinvent, but re-experience this will, right? And so, like, it's, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that it needs to come from both pressure inside and outside of these institutions. It is not, it, one will only go as, you can only push an institution from the inside so far without external pressure asking to go even farther and then they find them way, there's some way in between. And some people will call that, well, that's a sellout position or that's not radical enough, that's not this. From my position, the thing that I can get universities to do and also, I don't, I only comment on things and really push on things that are related to what I am an expert on, right? I'm connected to my research and I use, and I marshal my research. I use those narratives to push institutions to do, not just to do better for the students that they have right now, but to put policies and practices in place for the next generation of students that I hope will begin to change their thinking. Because it's not just the institutions that are going to be continued. It's like that kind of, that kind of, um, that inertia of the, you know, that, that comes with the people who they hire, the mm -hmm. kind of policies that they put in place, the way they do budgeting, the way in which they, they, um, they set their calendars, all these different things are just continuing to, to perpetuate the kind of thinking that leads to exclusion of black and brown folks, um, the kind of policies that don't, that, that why do we even need, um, you know, places, you know, offices that make sure that our vendors are, um, you know, mm -hmm. represent across groups when like, you know, what restaurants are in the town that you have, that you're in and things like that, right? Those are the things that we need to change. It's, it has to come from both inside and outside the university, but I'm not a person who thinks that it's going to happen overnight or we need to blow up the system and then completely overhaul it overnight. Because I think the question for me is, are we going to create in that rush even worse or detrimental mm -hmm. policies than what we have right now? And that's what I really, really worry about with being too quick to just 
state, let's dismantle without actually fully understanding the ways in which our racist, classist, sexist policies are implementing everyday life as a whole. So you, you talked about uh, change, and Tressie, you mentioned this, uh, a kind of transformational moment that we're in uh, earlier. Um, and certainly we're all living through, uh, so I, want, I just wanted to quickly follow up on that. Um, so we're living through a summer, really unlike any summer we'll probably uh, uh, have. And how, uh, and, you, and you both have been getting at this, I mean, how can institutions, uh, any institution, uh, and, and maybe even, you, you know, uh, how can the faculty member, how can we leverage this moment as a way of, you know, keeping, hopefully keeping things moving forward, right? It just seems like we're at this really sort of interesting time, critical moment. Um, how do we, and, and this kind of gets to Tony's point too, right? How do we not let this slip by mm -hmm. 15 years from now? Well, you know, hey, didn't we do this 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, when I was doing my dissertation, my uh, dissertation advisor, who had been doing the sociology of education for uh, a very long time, I won't say how long, <laughs> but a very long time, uh, he said, you know, the thing about being a sociologist of education is that at some point you have to accept that everybody already knows all of this stuff. He's like, he's, he had lived through enough cycles of every 10 years us rediscovering, for example, uh, you know, that uh, the points of access were unequal or that funding was unequal or that residential segregation was a thing. He said, but the thing is that you needed to do that work in preparation for times when people were ready to hear it. I have to believe that this is such a time. So the first thing uh, is to, to my mind is that during a point of crisis, and I you know, call out here to like disaster capitalism and that whole idea, there are already a lot of forces on opposite sides um, who see th these moments as opportunities to accelerate the extraction. Money, people, goods, uh, uh, capital from our institutions. We have work that is prepared us to be on the other side of that. We just somehow don't always call to it or remember it in these moments. So I would uh, encourage my colleagues with the idea that we have been doing our research and our work for just such a time as this. So every equity work workshop, every research program, every research agenda about access and inequality and et cetera, have prepared us for this moment that we know what the levers of opportunism will be. And we should have, while we can disagree on some of the margins of some of those debates, we do have consensus about some of the big things. And this is a moment for us to speak to what it is we do know affirmatively, right? We do know, as Tony says, that social class matters. And in fact, hardens the porousness of racial and gender stratification through higher education. We do know that expansion in and of itself without attending to the political and economic realities of higher education access will just create low quality, high risk opportunities yes. for the most vulnerable students. We do know that residential segregation and inequalities in funding prepare us differently for points of access. We know those things and now's the time to say what we do know. So that's the first thing I think in this moment. I think the second thing is for us to be realistic about the fact that this crisis of ours is not impacting us all the same. Yes. There are those of us right now who can be prepared to speak to the public because we aren't teaching a 5-5 five -five, uh, at an institution that is face facing financial exigency and that we almost owe it, I think, to our colleagues who are in those circumstances to be, um, you know, strong supporters and vocal about our support about what higher education is um, and what that social compact is right now. I think we owe it. I think under good times, we can all kind of choose to dip our toes in and out of the public discourse. I don't think this is one of those good times. <laughs> I think the times and the stakes are sufficiently high that we need all hands on deck. And then the third thing I think is that in moments like this, change can be both positive and negative, and to keep that in mind, that I don't think our goal here should be the status quo. That if 
these external threats are coming from the institution, it's actually one way to think about that is that it is a wonderful moment to enact the things that we think will make the organization better. That it is should not be a defense of what the institution currently is, but a defense of what the institution now has the capacity to become. Uh, as threatening as something like should we be online can be in the wrong hands, I got news for you. In the right hands, it's a wonderful point of access for underserved communities and students. So let's be the right hands. How do we do this thing ethically, morally, um, and sustainably? Let's be out there um, as part of that conversation because the conversation is going to happen. What an external crisis and threat does to institutions um, is, you know, the hawks are the hawks are circling, y'all. They're they're at the door, <laughs> right? This is this is not a time to be shy about what our expertise is about what our morals and our values are and what we're kind of willing to do to defend them. You know, it, I'm so glad that I discovered LeVar Burton Reads and uh -huh. Speculative Fiction in the last year because it has forced me to, to return to having an imagination that is not constrained by what we are told can and cannot happen in higher education. And I almost wish there was a way we can ball that up because the fact that even now some schools are turning away from the SAT, not just for this year, but going forward, think about what that means for the legacy of exclusion from all of higher education because of how classed and race, races that te the test can be. Right, just think about the ways in which we think about the pathways to higher education and more, more importantly, the thinking about why. Because now we're talking about students who are doing homework at Starbucks, but now they can't do homework at Starbucks because you can't congregate, so they're doing homework in parking lots, but now they still need the SAT mm -hmm. online, right? Do we actually need a test like the SAT or the GRE when we know they don't have the predictive power of how you're gonna perform when you're getting in school? Those little moments that literally changed with the way we think. Because if you had asked me a year ago, I would have told you that, that the SAT and college admissions were so mm -hmm. um, interlocked that that's a, that's a knot we will never ever be able to untie. And yet here we are, right? That change moment, that exogenous shock to the system that completely just floored everyone and is forcing us to think outside of the box. And it's like those moments that I think we can begin to, 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 to think about how and not just how we can change, but what, right? Because I think so many, so many times like, okay, we can do this, we can move the money here, we can adjust this policy, we can hire a CDO and make him, the, make him or her the only black person in the entire senior staff. That's the how that we have been doing it in higher education, but we haven't really discussed what, like how big of a what, like how, how much can we actually change? Now we are literally thinking about removing the single greatest mechanism for college admissions that we have been able to use, right? This is, you know, these are the kind of questions that we are asking ourselves. And I think it, it has to begin with a more expensive way of thinking, because if we can actually see it, then we can do it. Even with the obstacles, we can begin to actually put in place things that are having an effect beyond what we think is normal or within within bounds because right now everything is so uncertain that you know we have a we have the fertile ground to have these kind of very different conversations mm. Did, is it particularly hard and and then i i really should get to some questions here in the chat so i'm promising everybody i will before they come and and run me out of town oh they can't run me out of town we're all virtual <laughs> <laughs> so um but i mean is it um, is it particularly difficult in higher education? Because, I mean, there, there's a, a sort of a, in, in the uh, public's mind, higher education is often this sort of hotbed of radical thinkers and, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, when you talk to people in higher education, you discover it is just an, uh, an incredibly conservative institution. And so is it, um, I, I, I love this idea that you both are getting at, but that Tony just, re, just mentioned a second ago, is 
thinking big, how, you know, so how, how is it that we can, <clears throat> again, it, it, it's this particular moment we have where people are thinking in, in bigger, more visionary ways, um, in, in part coming out of a, of a crisis, but coming out of really two crises, multiple crises. Mm -hmm. And so um, is there, um, what, what's the, what's the, the magic answer to overcoming the conservative nature of the industry that we're in? I think Tracy spoke on, I think the part that makes higher education the most conservative is the financial revenue streams. Mm. In the way, I mean, we, as far as like changing a lot of the institutional policy, mm. the protection of the endowments, right? Like, like, like we, um, it was like Citizens United all over again, where like the endowment became a protected, uh, someone who should be protected, right? Not something that should be used to fund the institution, but rather someone to be protected against the big, a big, the big bad world. Um, and, and so when you think about how many measures, you know, you know, when I thought about like how schools shut down, that was a general council decision. I would, the way in which certain schools shut down, you can tell there wasn't a single student life or student affairs person in the room because of how the, how, how the shutdown was outlined. Now, do I agree that every school that every school should have shut down when they did? Yes, and I consulted on a number of colleges um, about uh, about their decision. But the how, again, right? So the number is zero one. Did you shut down? Did you not? But the how you shut down? Did you just kick everybody out and give them twenty four hours or forty eight hours, or did you know that some of your students didn't have internet, all that kind of stuff like that when they went home? But it was a but the fact that the conservative nature was like we don't want to get sued. We have to protect the endowment. Right, that was a general counsel call under the guise of a public health response, which it was. It wasn't, but it was a, it was more guided by how we protect ourselves, right? How do we not put ourselves in, you know, you know, in the crossfire for being sued or being somehow financially responsible for something? And I think that that keeps the conservative streak at the most institutional, foundational level. It's not just having a more conservative leader who wants to set curfews on campus and stuff like that. That will change with administration every eight years up and down. But at the institutional level, the protection of the endowment and the, finan and, and the financial streams that happen, that's what keeps the university, I think, on, on, on a more conservative bent um, without, 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 without the normal dips of, of, mm -hmm. of difference in leadership. Yeah. And I would just expand the, I think the, for the institutions that don't have endowments, and Tony's yeah. absolutely right. I love, by the way, this um, analogy to Citizens United, the personification mm -hmm. of the endowment uh, as being vulnerable and in need of protection yeah. and being a democratic partner, right, in the public good. Um, <laughs> but I would also add, for the institutions, the vast institutions who don't have an endowment, the, the disciplining um, uh, mechanism tends to be currying political favor which indirectly is doing the same thing the endowment does. So you curry your community college system, for example, you have to curry political favor because almost the entirety of your budget rises and falls with you being a pet project of a state legislator, right? Which is why you'll see these shifting priorities sometimes that seem chaotic at the institutional level at these institutions is because they're usually trying to get some sort of political partnership that will sustain the institution's economic and political visibility at the state level. So you see it at historically black colleges are, are you know, this is infamous in how HBCUs have been made into conservative institutions uh, by making them so economically vulnerable that their you know two to three year survival depends on uh, the makeup of the uh, of the um, state legislative body that year, right? Um, so one of the ways uh, that if we want institutions, yes, to be um, not progressive in the big sense, but um, uh, you know amenable 
to the potential of being diverse and diversified, um, we do have to attack and sort of understand, and I think give the public a language for understanding how higher education is actually financed and run, and that it isn't, you know, the cultural Marxist professors who are running amok mm -hmm. across the yard, that it is in fact these conversations in your board of visitors meetings, it's the boring conversations about finance on a, some subcommittee at some state legislature, right? Uh, to find the stories in that, quite frankly, and, and pull them out, I think can do, do a lot to give the public a language. I think it's what canceling student debt has done in the public imagination, by the way. To cancel student debt to me is not a political uh, pro it is not a, you know, it's not a bureaucratic program. It is a political idea. And that's why I think it caught on with people, whether it works in practice or not is something for those of us who do that work to figure out. But what it absolutely captured was people's, you know, linked fates and their shared debt burden and what it had done to their lives. And people could understand that, which is why I think we got some political purchase out of that concept. So a similar concept to me of understanding like, hey, um, Maybe it shouldn't be all college. Maybe we need to re you know, reintroduce the idea of public, or maybe we need to reintroduce the idea of a democratic institution and what that looks like. And in that way, if we move that part of the needle, I actually think we can leverage institutions' conservatism against itself. Institutions don't wanna be out of step with popular opinion. Right. <laughs> right? So you change popular opinion and a conservative institution will do all kinds of radical things. Uh, that's why you got a Black Lives Matter, you know, <laughs> banner uh, unfurled on an institution right now today that, you know, five years ago, you couldn't even get them to talk about a Black student union, right? You change the dominant conversation and a conservative institution will do a lot of radical things. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I, I do want to get to uh, some questions that have popped up. Um, so um, this is, uh, in a way, I think, <clears throat> this kind of goes back to that that question about uh, particularly first generation students um, and uh, uh, who come to our institutions and and um, uh, often have those those hurdles right the small hurdles that build up. Um, so this person writes, my institution is piloting a new first year seminar program, and uh, this person is co teaching in it. We are designing from scratch, but given the COVID-19 transmission, have to work within the framework of the institution-wide learning management system. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on what everyday things we can do? Uh, and they give the example, such as defining office hours, uh, particularly in relation to LMS, LMS systems, which are built upon uh, the privileged paradigms, uh, what can we do to do better? Uh, in that sort of environment. So this kind of gets to the, the distance learning issue, right? The thing for me is that if we actually would have built our responses and our approaches to, I'm thinking about in COVID in particular, to education um, and to meeting students and meeting students where they are, we would not, if we, if we would have used our first gen and lower income students as the, student as a, as a target population we would not only have cast a stronger safety net we would actually cast a wider safety net and then that would have been a perfect lesson for right now because those learning management systems are cookie cutter but we all know who gets left on the side who gets discarded right you're not thinking about the fact that you need to do things like define office hours or i'll put myself on front street when i got to amherst for example i thought amherst was a much more religious institution because everyone kept talking about fellowships and now for me, <laughs> fellowship, being home on Sunday means That's eating food right. after church, not uh -huh. Banneke, Rose, and Marshall, right? And so just how coded the language of higher education is, uh -huh. that when you try to have something that is too, that is packaged, that is so easily packaged, you end up leaving a lot of students out. And so the question is, again, what do we take for granted, right? There are certain times that we have to not just walk through a syllabus but define what a syllabus is because in high school in public high school we didn't have a syllabus we just had a list of assignments the fact that some classes only have a 20 page paper at the end and students don't understand how to budget time and thinking right those are they're just they're just a lot of like little small things that are embedded but on the flip side 
how do we make sure our students are able to log in, have a space to, um, to log in from? Are, are, are we holding them accountable for things that make it disproportionately hard for first gen and lower income students to, um, to do like, uh, you know, people who are, you know, they tend to be working more even during COVID. They tend to be um, taking care of their families, especially if they're racial or ethnic minorities. They don't have a space to themselves. And so do we, how, how are we assigning like mandatory class time and how flexible would that be? How, you know, how much do we understand the, the lived experiences of our students at home and how it affects them even if they were, even when they were, you know, when they are on campus. So how do we begin to, to, to think about those everyday experiences and how we shape with assignments? Because these are questions that I'm even thinking about for myself as I teach this year. Right, we, we decided to go 100% online at the Ed School um, roughly in April, like really, really, really early. And so, but even now thinking about how many of our students are not just, you know, you know dependent upon access to internet and, and other things like that, but also international students, and international first gen, international lower income students who make us think about, you know, all these different, like who's able to access the material and when, and then how we begin to understand that. But I always go back, it's like those little small things will be the difference between those who feel included in the conversation and those who feel excluded from it. And that can mean the difference between retaining the material, understanding it, developing an interest in it, developing an affinity for it that you want to actually go to graduate school to explore it more. Mm -hmm. That literally could be the difference. Everything Tony said. <laughs> um, so the... Uh, um, and I think, you know, given the, um, so th these are really pressing issues on our campus. Um, Indiana University, Kokomo, we're a regional branch of uh, Indiana University, uh, lots of first generation students. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I think we in, are, are increasingly doing a better job of being cognizant of these, these issues, right? The, the realizing that um, <clears throat> even, if, even if many of us are first-generation students, I was a first-generation student, but I have been in higher education so long, it's just second nature to me, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so even though I had that experience, I have long forgotten mm -hmm. What what it's what it's like to not understand the nomenclature, not understand what offices do what, right? Um, Which is how it's supposed to go. If we yeah, if we're acclimated to and professionalized properly. That's the whole point, right? Someone mm -hmm. said earlier in chat the sort of the violence of professionalization is that we get separated from our communities of origin. That's what it's supposed to do, um, and so it can be really difficult to maintain that perspective. Um, yeah, I, um, someone mentioned, can I, I wanted to add two things to the teaching online in the LMS. You know, yeah. some people, if you've ever followed my work, you know, I have a longstanding critique of LMSs. And so <laughs> let me have it. Well. <laughs> Thank you. So, so first thing, can please. I really please get people to show up for the talks and the hiring process of the chief technology officer or the chief information mm -hmm. officer on your campus? Mm -hmm. I actually think it is more important to show up for that than it is the dean's talks. And I'm not even kidding. Right now, the locus of power in your institution has been shifted away from academic affairs into technology and information in a way that was true before COVID and right now is about to be more true even than that. Um, it is probably one of the most least understood, it's one of the least understood uh, and most important roles on the modern college campus. And I think that faculty governance and mostly operates outside of faculty governance, faculty governance needs to exert some authority um, and engagement with that process. Um, and then the second thing is talk about a micro thing. I have had huge success with using um, audio clips in my online classes to help mm -hmm. students around some of the things Tony was talking about, which is the point of access for like, you know, stable enough internet to be on Google Docs and a collaborative document. We don't think about that. Um, how unstable those doc those um, uh, technologies are when you are on weak internet or don't have regular internet access mm -hmm. to check mm -hmm. them or you're using a phone. Um, and so I've had a lot of success with visual and audio assignments uh, to supplement. So uh, if any of you are fans of podcasts, for example, I think there's a really, you know, 
um, rich potential there for a pedagogical practice for students. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's phone right now allows them sort of the audio and recording capacity, um, and uh, that might be helpful. I was going to add, um, oh shoot, the, oh wow, the, I, I think you're absolutely right about um, including, it's also like in, including different, including different types of voices when we are doing our syllabus. And one thing that, that I found like very, 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 very helpful, I want to just double down on the podcast, but also like look up the ways in which we can bring interviews in, um, uh, in into the course and different. Because I, so I'll put I'll put myself on Front Street again. So I actually start my book, my class, Cream Cash was everything around me with lower ed, and I end with Pedigree, uh, which is Laura oh, Rivera. So to actually begin and end with two women of color um, just was like just very very important to me. But I also include interviews or talks that they've given. Uh, so there's kids love when we bring up the Trevor Noah interview or different things like that, but also different types of different types of medium. And I think at some schools that's looked, that's not um, mm -hmm. part of the lexicon that you should be engaging in. And if it's not a annual review, this or journal of this, um, then it's not really worth talking about yet. Those journal articles were written with data from five years ago. The, the journal article was published three years ago but how do we also put it in conversation with today's things? And I think the way in which um, sometimes the, 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 the management system and how packaged it can be, like how do we also let it be as reflective as we need, uh, um, flexible as we need it to be with the changing nature of, with the changing, changing nature of society, but also different media that students can access in different sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. Love that, thanks, Tony. So, so both of you, um, in in different ways, but very powerfully address the 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 thinking about higher education as a credentialing industry, right? That what what we do is we we uh, bring people in and they they go through certain um, hurdles and then they get a credential at the end and then it's all about it's it's about getting that credential. Um, and so this is a a question that. Um, uh, that Fiona had um, about thinking about the badging movement, um, you know, that uh, where, you know, liberal arts courses will be writing skill courses and, or they might be critical thinking skill courses. And so the, or, or cultural competency, um, right? That, that um, in the end you're going to, you know, higher education is, um, Re reduced in some ways, maybe, um, uh, to put it in negative terms, to a bunch of badges that people get that tell the world, okay, I do these things, right? Um, and so the question is um, whether this, this badging movement, um, in some cases, uh, is a blessing or a threat to, to teachers at colleges and universities, and, and I'll add a, a blessing or a threat to students at colleges and universities? Yes and no. I mean, I think it is one of these contradictions. I think it's the, I think the um, badging and micro-credentialing is embedded in mm. the contradiction that we have with access, which is mm. how do we expand access while, while maintaining what it, an insignificant part of the value of higher education is, which is its ability to exclude people. Like both of those have to be true at the same time because that's just how we built it. Now, I think we can build different incentives. I actually do think that we could have a system and that other um, advanced economies absolutely have one where there is um, you know, broader access within an employment and a labor market framework that strips away some of the prestige and uh, shifts more of the value to what your actual human skill development and capital was. Like, I think that's possible, mm -hmm. but it's just not what the system we have. So given the system that we have, I have been professionally resistant to micro-credentialing because the way and the evidence now bears out that at least uh, micro-credentials 1.0 and 2.0 anyway, um, could not confer the benefits of uh, social mobility transformation 
uh, for non-traditional and low-income and minoritized students, right? That the Google certificate is not going to work you out of labor market discrimination. And if it doesn't, then I am fundamentally disinterested in the credential. Um, if you're going to do that, then it's a professional association. No problem with that. You get to kind of have a professional. I think, however, that when we certify things in an academic institution, it means something very particular. Now, I think that's the student problem. Uh, the labor problem is that I don't think it is a... Um, I don't think it is a coincidence that one of the attractive aspects from administration level of micro-credentials is that it decouples some part of the learning experience from the professor who is providing it. Meaning once we sort of capture the sort of micro-credential, we can now port it. it you know, there are lots, there's lots of talk when people come to sell these things on your campus. Again, highly recommend you go to these sessions. When these LMS people and whatever and uh, Michael, you know, tutor and all these people come to your campus, go, go to that talk. Because what they sell them on is that this will make, um, uh, that, it will, that it will level off labor shops in the institution by getting a container for a class and the container can be ported from one class to the next. And if the professor is sick, you can still run the container. And isn't that great? It is great if we think that that's what education is that it is not a set of social relations between students, by the way, and the students and the professor in a larger community. If you think that that is what education is, a content delivery system, um, then at some point you just, you just need to produce enough content and you don't have to worry about the people who deliver it. Uh, now that's a certain type of thing. I just don't think it's education. Um, and in fact, the systems that have, that's why I think the systems that you know, specialize in that, Linda's and all of that of the world, were financially unviable until they embed themselves in our institutions. If they were so great, why do they need to be delivered by us? <laughs> They're such a great, That's great point. innovation. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> why do they need to happen on our platforms, be delivered by mm -hmm. us? Because there's still some value clearly that we're providing uh, to the content. So I am very cautious of these things. Mm -hmm. I would also say at a practical level as someone who teaches like Tony does try, I try to, not try, I do embed a diversity of experts and expertise in my teaching and learning. The community of content available for what I would call critical knowledges is extremely limited, mm -hmm. right? You go and you find me a suitable online content module for critical race theory. Like, I, I challenge you. I've looked. I'm just going to say I'm cheating. I already know it doesn't exist. You find me the suitable modules for um, intersectionality. You find me the suitable, no one even started on indigenous knowledges and Native American knowledges. Like, mm -hmm. you go find me that knowledge in a content delivery model. Um, and uh, I would be interested to see if you think you could put together something that would rough, be roughly proximate to a liberal arts education. Um, the content just isn't there, and I don't think the incentives will ever be there for us to have content in that way. Um, and so for, for all of those reasons, I'm very cautious about that uh, animization of academic knowledge. Um, Tony, did you want to add anything to that? or No, I, no, I totally agree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, here's probably our last question um, because we're nearing the end of our uh, hour and a half. And thank you both for, for um, uh, the, the entire conversation. Um, so the, the uh, uh, kind of a two part question, um, do, you do you think the same points about the importance of grounding our research understanding in student experiences applies to how we think about assessment that's aimed at internal improvement, the student's improvement. In other words, to what extent could changes in assessment provide a lever for helping us understand the issues you address and make some of the changes you seek at a more micro class or program and or institutional level? Mm. Oh man. I mean, the first thing that came to mind for me is like even thinking about what do we value? Do we, do we, do we value um, growth over time or immediate competency, mm. right? And how much of that is already so heavily classed and raised within higher education because of the inequalities that students have to go through beforehand? I mean, the thing is, you know, you know a lot of people want to, 
you know, is it a measure of a teacher who can get, who can get his or her or their entire class to a point of understanding material? Or is it those who have already, who, who keep a certain stratified um, grading scheme at the end, right? Mm -hmm. So when I think about assessment, especially for me, and like, again, I said, you know, I went to Amherst, I, you know, been at Harvard since 2008 as a graduate student and now a professor, you know, so when I think about, you know, we do a lot of research trying to understand, I do a lot of research trying to understand how social class shapes students' experience and the myriad of ways in which the social side of academic life, right? The interactions, the knowing how to go to office hours and knowing how to get support services, like all the things that you have to have the cultural competency to be savvy enough to ask for help, to demand time with a professor, all the things that deepen your learning as compared to, and how does that not, and yet, none of that gets accounted for in how we assess students. And I, I bring up the example with students about the importance of going to office hours. And I could talk to them about the literature, but I said, the difference between going to off, the reason why I, I wanna push you to go to office hours is not so that you can get help on a particular assignment. It's so that you can understand how the professor thinks, mm -hmm. right? Because if you can understand how I ask questions, then you can, then you have a head start in answering the question because you already know a few of my tricks. You know that I'm gonna to try to push you to think outside the box on one particular thing that's a little bit different from the homework. And so when I think about the way, the way in which we do assessment, um, the fact that we don't pay attention to the how those kind of inequalities fuel students' performance, right? Because there was this one study that actually showed that every visit to office hours corresponded with a Oh God, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but like a a 1.2% bump in your final grade, mm -hmm. right? Over the course of a semester, right? So you could actually go up just about 10 points or rather it was correlated that you went up with just about 10 points the more you went to office hours uh, once you hit that threshold, right? Mm -hmm. Just thinking about mm -hmm. things like that. Are we assessing, what are we assessing? Students ability or students comfort and able to get the answer? And right, so when we think about different ways like that, or think about how we do awards, like Phi Beta Kappa, I always think it's interesting because you can get, you know, you can get one bad grade your freshman fall or one grade, one bad grade your senior spring, but we always know which one's going to derail your GPA. One sets a ceiling that you will never get beyond and the other sets a floor. And so the way in which we even understand who is able to hit the ground running and who actually has a little bit of a struggle and then be able to go, it should be a mark of us as, as an institution, how many students can we, how, like, what would happen if we actually built our assessment more around competency, I mean, um, not, not growth, than initial competency with the uh, initial competency that really shows just like the gap that students come in with because of the inequality, not because of innate ability. That's a wonderful point. Maybe. Um, well, and it, it, the, um, there, there's been, I've got a, uh, there's some folks at uh, IU East in the, in the uh, math program who've done a, a really interesting thing in terms of extending semesters for, for students in, mm -hmm. um, you know, those gateway courses, right? The mm -hmm. math course that, that often if students, do poorly in that class, they just don't think they can do higher education, they just quit, right? And so if we think about, hey, we're, in, in the long run, it's about um, getting students to a certain level of success. And some students might be able to do that in eight weeks, some students may need 20 weeks, or some, you know, that we do have this sort of artificial time frame where then you do end up with that sort of grade distribution, right? Because, well, you know, yeah. I was able to help students get to here, but they couldn't get that extra step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we have examples. I mean, the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at University of Maryland, Baltimore County is an example. Like there are some students who, like they, they have a program where sometimes students will retake a course like one of the science courses because they're really big on producing, you know, um, STEM folks of color. Like there are like also like what what do we're kind of also like 
locked into this four year period of, you know, eight semesters or 12 semesters or whatever like that, and believe that this marshalling through is the only way that we need to yet when we've had experiments where students are able to retake a course or extend it by a year, they have the same outcomes of going to medical school, going to get PhDs, going to get different things. We have examples of really innovative strategies to make sure that students are making it. Um, but the financial model of the four-year institution, how funding is and things like that is, you know, one, one barrier. Okay. Right. But it's some very interesting things that we can actually do. And there are some examples, you know, I think about what, you know, like what Dillard University and, and New Orleans is doing. Um, Xavier, yeah. Right, and Xavier, right. right. Xavier has produced yeah. more black doctors than any other, country, yeah. other school in the country. Like, there, are a, there are many different examples that we can actually learn from if we are brave enough to think outside of I think outside of the box and think that, you know, we are locked in that any kind of misstep means that you shouldn't or any kind of want early failure means that you shouldn't. If that was the case, then we wouldn't be anything. No one would be anything if your code had to be perfect the first time you wrote it. Mm -hmm. Think about how many technologies we would not have if that was the case. How many studies that we that we would not have um, perfected by now. So, you know, literally trial and error is, is science, right? Like at the heart of it is not this perfect system, no matter how much, you know, you want to write up your, write up your, your, your data and method section and saying that you were from point A to point Z in one, you know, once at a time, that's a bunch of, that's a lie, right? Yeah. And so the way in which you actually do is about trial and error. And what happens if we bring a little bit of that back into higher mm. education? Yeah. Well, I want to uh, I want to thank both of you a lot. I've we, we've actually kept you a few extra minutes, um, so I just appreciate the conversation. I very much appreciated the books, um, and uh, um, all the best, Tressy, at your new home. Thank you so much, Eric. And uh, it, and it was great chatting with both of you. Thank you very much. Same here. Good to see you, Tony. Oh, no. Thank to you. Phone call, my friend. All right. Thanks, Definitely. everybody. Have All a wonderful right. Thank you all so much.